Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Ko, so much for your kind introduction. And I appreciate the opportunity today to uh, share with you the data on liver cancer epidemiology, early diagnosis, and prevention. We will focus mainly on HCC, which makes up about 80 to 90% of primary liver cancer, the disease burden, major causes, and the five-year survival that is still very low now, and how we could impact this with early diagnosis and prevention. As of 2020, globally, there were about 900,000 incident HCC cases and about 830,000 deaths. And as you could see, the close approximation of the incident case number and the death numbers suggests that this is a pretty deadly cancer. And in fact, in 46 countries, HCC is among the top three cancer deaths. And these bad numbers are expected to continue to rise by more than 50% between 2020 and 2040. The major burdens, as you could see in the map, are in the Western Pacific and Sub-Saharan Africa. In the US, fortunately, our trends seem to have plateaued out a little bit in the past 10 years. 2024 estimate is about 41,000 incidents, HCC, and about 30,000 deaths. Pretty close, consistent with the high mortality of this cancer. This is the latest data that I have from the GBD collaboration for etiology of HCC in 2015. So globally, about one third is from Hep B, one third alcohol, and followed by HCV, about one fifth. In the US or high income North Africa, our number two causes are alcohol and HCV. Now HPV only makes up about 99% total of the US population uh, HCC burden, but in the Bay Area and in immigrant communities from endemic areas, it is really the major uh, problem. Now, I wanted to show this and wanted to highlight the fact that we should expect changes from here. And I could show you some of those data uh, in the next slide. And that is because in 2014, uh, uh, we had a cure for HCV where 95% 95, 95 or more of patients can expect a cure with a very simple treatment. And in 2005, and since then, we have had very good suppressive HBV medication, but the decline for HBV has been much slower because we have much worse problem with linkage to care with hepatitis B uh, in our immigrant population. And for the other category, 23% here, the majority of these are likely metabolic associated steatotic liver disease, MASLD, formerly known as uh, MAFLD. So this is the mortality data related to HCC in the US. And this is our whole US population from the CDC and our national vital statistics database. So you could see that the age standardized mortality rate here continue to rise, not as much as the global estimate, but it is rising and is drastic in the older age group here, uh, 65 and above. In 2002 um, uh, here, you can see that 80% of the HCC mortality is still from HCV and alcohol, and HCV is still more than 50%. However, we should expect to see uh, differences. So this is the forecast data. So you can see that by 2026, alcohol is expected to overtake HCV as number one cause of HCC death. And by 2032, uh, mass LD or metabolic fatty liver disease would uh, be number two. Some of these we would have to see um, and wait for data in the coming years to see because this forecasting assumed that there, had, there would be no changes, um, but we do see an increase in HCV incidence with the opioid epidemic here and a decline in HCV diagnosis and treatment since 2018 and especially during the pandemic. So um, the decline for HCV-related death may not be as fast in the future as seen in the past. I wanted to um, uh, discuss alcohol at least briefly because even though we do not really have a curative treatment for this or a simple treatment to this, it is uh, the fastest rising cause 
of um, uh, HCV related mortality. And one in three cases currently is due to alcohol globally, even in endemic area for Hep B like East Asia and also in the US. And one thing to note is that the survival for HCC and alcohol related liver disease is poorer because they also have poorer HCC surveillance. So really a, a group that is uh, really um, uh, uh, affected with the worst um, outcome. I also wanted to uh, bring our attention to avoid the old terminology of alcoholic liver disease because it can be stigmatizing to our patient and our ICD code system is still pulling it in as alcoholic liver disease. But I would encourage all of us to manually uh, uh, fix that uh, and avoid that. Now, in terms of metabolic um, steatotic fatty liver disease, as of 2019, the prevalence was already 37% and is expected to continue to increase. And our forecasting work um, uh, suggests that by 2040, uh, about 55% of the world population would have uh, metabolic fatty liver disease. The incidence is also increasing. So you can see here, the estimate before 2010 was about 40 per 1,000, and it would uh, become 50 um, after 2010. Um, and the fastest rate is actually in China and higher in people with metabolic disease um, and obesity. One of the challenges with um, uh, metabolic fatty liver disease in terms of uh, diagnosis and linkage to care is that a good amount, 40% of these patients are not obese. And because of that, probably the, the awareness is not high for both patients and providers, so screening um, and diagnosis is lacking. At the same time, our group as well as others have found that the non-obese NAFOD actually has worse overall mortality. So they are not healthier, they actually worse off. <clears throat> and this is to sort of like compare the uh, care gap and disease awareness rate. So for hepatitis B is poor, 15%. For hep C is far from, uh, uh, from optimal, only 50%. But for uh, fatty liver disease um, um, uh, that is not related to alcohol is even worse, 5%. So these data come from the NHANES, so our US epidemiology cohort, where all patients would be asked a question, are you aware you have a liver disease? And patients would just ask, uh, answer yes or no. Now, I would like to focus the rest of our talk, um, um, or, um, our meeting today, on the poor five-year HCC survival and how we can impact this um, with uh, early diagnosis and prevention. We need to see where the care gaps are, and hopefully that will guide us on where we should target. So how can we impact HCC-related mortality? Number one, we can try to impact the survival of patients who already have HCC by optimizing HCC treatment. Now, fortunately, um, in the recent five, 10 years, there have been great advances in systemic therapy for uh, HCC. But generally, the incremental survival benefits for with these treatments uh, are measured generally in the matter of months and not like years. So I believe that early diagnosis of HCC and also prevention of new HCC development would uh, be more likely to impact the public health trends that uh, we are seeing. So we can prevent the primary liver disease from happening, or we can, and we can prevent HCC development in people who are already having uh, liver diseases and are at risk. Um, as I already alluded to um, earlier, for non-viral alcohol and metabolic um, associated fatty liver disease, the treatment is um, li very limited, but there have been great advances in antiviral therapies for viral uh, diseases, but have we been using it optimally? Can we do better? So this is a complicated schematic, but the whole point I would like to show this is that, as you could see, early HCC means curative treatment. The survival can be 50 to 80%. Uh, if the patient get curative treatment with uh, resection or with liver transplant. But unfortunately, generally only about 10% of the HCC population now would be eligible for these curative treatment. So we need to move more people 
into the early HCC and curative treatment part if we want to really make a major changes in um, the outcome of HCC and the disease burden. So where can we impact? So we can, in, we can do primary prevention, meaning that we can prevent liver disease and prevent HCC in people with liver disease. Secondary prevention refers to preventing HCC or minimizing the, um, the, the impact of HCC by early diagnosis and prevention of HCC in people who already have liver disease. And then tertiary prevention is how to uh, decrease uh, the morbidity and mortality of people who already have HCC. So um, uh, I would like to focus the rest of the time we have today on uh, these areas. And I would like to start first with the worst off population, people who already have HCC. So there are still a lot we can do for these uh, patients with tertiary prevention with antiviral for the viral group at least. So we have um, real world data for both hepatitis B and hepatitis C related HCC here in people with cirrhosis as well as non-cirrhosis and that we can see clear improvement in survival. And these are overall survival um, in these patients who are treated with antiviral therapy for both B and C. And data come from both the US as well as um, overseas and Asia Pacific. And as you can see in here, the median survival, the incremental benefit here is 18 months, which is quite a bit more than many other systemic treatment that we are using for HCC. And this is very well tolerated and fairly inexpensive now, especially for HBV, so um, uh, it should really be used. Now, the survival benefits with the novel systemic HCC treatment, in fact, was found significant in only viral HCC in a recent uh, registration trial for one of these um, uh, regimens. So the factors that are associated with mortality, and this is the case for HBV, timing matters. So if the antiviral was started prior to HCC diagnosis, the benefits is about 40% reduction. Whereas if it started late after HCC diagnosis, it's only about 20%. So initiation of treatment is important, but timing also matters. And I also point, I want to point your attention to these data because it's not only the people who get curative treatment that would benefit. In this um, uh, study, we found that in the subgroup of people with the most advanced liver disease, cirrhosis, child C, as well as the people with the most advanced HCC, BCLC stage C and D here, and even the people who only get palliative treatment like with taste or supportive care only, there are still survival benefits. And for hepatitis B, the treatment is very well tolerated and there are generics now, so it is um, uh, fairly inexpensive as well. So what is the problem with this? The problem is that currently there are no specific antiviral guideline treatment criteria for HCC from both the American and the European society. People have focused on people with fibrosis and cirrhosis and not as much on HCC. So these data that we did um, several years ago now, and the data come from Stanford, Mayo Clinic, um, Mount Sinai, um, uh, 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 big center like Assam from Korea and in Kaohsiung in Taiwan. And we found that at the time of ACC diagnosis, only 17% were on antiviral treatment. And even after follow-up, you know, for uh, several years with HCC, only 50% receive antiviral. Um, so the utilization really uh, can be improved. What about uh, a real world cohort of US patients. So the data I just showed in the last slide was in tertiary center. So this is the data for real world US population from the Optum database up to 2021 here. So we could see that uh, we also saw a survival benefit, so overall survival here. We do not have cause specific uh, survival data from this database. And the treatment rate only 36.8%. So it's really far, you know, from uh, optimal. And we found major disparities um, by uh, race and ethnicity here. You can see that the Asian HCC patient are much more likely to get um, treated 50% versus only 20 to 30% in the other racial ethnic groups. So this suggests that perhaps community awareness, patient provider awareness 
uh, could play a significant role here because in the last 20 years, because of the high disease burden of HBV in the Asian community, there's a lot of community public advocacy um, um, and, and similar things, uh, uh, efforts should be done for the other groups as well. And this is real world uh, data for HCV related uh, HCC and, and, um, and this database contains only privately insured patients. So, um, so everyone have insurance. Uh, so at least the financial aspect of this um, is um, not uh, the major one or, or less than many other groups of patients who are underinsured or uninsured. Uh, but even in this group, the treatment rate uh, here is only 23%. Uh, and even though we saw a very um, good survival benefits here, and patients who were seen by the GI or infectious disease specialists are three times more likely to receive the treatment. So there are rooms for uh, improved community as well as provider and patient education and awareness for both hepatitis B and C uh, treatment here. And uh, more recently, we um, looked at the uh, uh, HCC patients with uh, Hep B and he or Hep C uh, at uh, about um, um, 12 study centers. And all of these are secondary tertiary uh, referral centers. And all of these patients uh, already underwent curative resection. So we wanna see in this very highly selected um, uh, group of patients, uh, what is the treatment rate? And we found that the treatment rate in here overall is also just 50%. So, so they are, it's pretty consistent in different settings and different places. Um, uh, the treatment rate um, is very low. For hepatitis C, it has improved dramatically uh, recently, but for hepatitis B, it's not getting better. And if anything, it looks like it's uh, maybe even getting worse. And uh, the reason for this is unclear. The data, however, show very clear survival benefits for both overall survival as well as recurrent uh, uh, free survival here. And again, early treatment matters. Early treatment was associated with much better um, uh, survival benefits than later treatment. So now moving on to secondary prevention. So antiviral treatment for people who already have viral liver disease and HCC surveillance in at-risk patients uh, for both viral and non-viral patients. So for HCV, um, since uh, DAA, the curative treatment in 2014, uh, we have a lot of data, uh, both in the US as well as overseas. Uh, and these are two examples. One is from a, um, uh, one of the French cohort of uh, uh, tertiary center uh, through our friends, um, uh, close to 10,000 patients here. And they clearly uh, show evidence of lower ACC and overall mortality in patients who were treated. And in our privately insured uh, database in the US, that includes 250,000 um, US uh, HCV patients here, we um, also found very consistent improved survival for both liver and non-liver um, um, uh, mortalities, including uh, HCC incidents here. And for HCV, um, uh, we are fortunate that we have very clear guidelines. So this is the US, liver and infectious disease society guidelines, and that basically anyone with HCV, acute or chronic, whose life expectancy is not um, severely um, short or low, that cannot be remedied by HCV should be treated. So basically, unless the patient is moribund that cannot be fixed with HCV treatment should be treated. And as I showed the data earlier, the treatment rate is still uh, pretty uh, limited. For HBV, we have data for the last 20 years um, that uh, antiviral therapy can reduce disease uh, progression, including HCC development, by about 40% in older studies. And for the newer agents that we have currently, the reduction is about 70, 80%. So the benefit is, is quite uh, clear. But the problem is this. The problem is that we have very poor care cascade uh, for HBV. Uh, the WHO estimate is only about 10% have been diagnosed and only a small fraction treated. Are we doing much better in the US? So many people may think that, you know, that may be the problem of Sub-Saharan Africa or in their resource limited area. 
So we wanted to see what it is in the US. So we use this database, uh, people with private insurance uh, in the US, and we, we do do a little bit better, but it's still very poor. Only about 18% of HPV patients in the US who have private insurance here have been diagnosed. And this database go to 2016. So, and we looked at people who have very advanced disease like cirrhosis and HCC, and you can see only about a third of people with cirrhosis and only a half, one half of people with HCC receive antiviral therapy. Now, um, in another data, US um, a nationwide database with lab data, uh, we uh, were able to determine the number and percent of people who beat current guideline criteria, and about two thirds had enough lab to be evaluated. Uh, but unfortunately, even in people who um, have enough lab evaluation and meet criteria, only about 60% uh, would initiate therapy on uh, follow-up, um, long-term follow-up on this database. And we did not really see significant changes between, uh, before 2010 and after that, which is pretty consistent with the data that I showed earlier for people who already got HCC and resection. HCV treatment rate, uh, has gone up, but not really for its um, uh, DV. And this is the uh, most um, um, uh, recent uh, work uh, that is expected to be released in a few days on May 3rd here. So this is our consortium work of um, 25 centers from nine countries, the US, Argentina, Spain, Romania, and several in the uh, Western Pacific uh, for about 12,000 patients. And these are all tertiary care liver centers. Um, and even in this, only about three quarter had the basic blood test required and only about 83% uh, of treatment eligible patients initiated uh, therapy. So this suggests that there are a lot of um, barriers that is uh, beyond just uh, physician pro, uh, um, uh, awareness and such, because even patients at Stanford, they are, I have patients that meet criteria, but they just don't want to get treating because the disease is asymptomatic and people feel that they don't need it. Uh, so, so a lot of um, uh, education and community awareness uh, continue um, uh, to be the key here. But uh, in this study, we uh, found, uh, we observed um, uh, important disparities. So female patients were about 50% less likely to receive antiviral therapy and Asian patients from the West um, uh, are also 50% less likely to receive adequate evaluation or treatment compared to Asians from the East. So this is a little bit paradoxical, you would think that, you know, in, in higher resource area, there would be less barrier um, uh, so it maybe it's a, not the financial um, uh, barriers here, but um, likely there's some cultural and language barriers uh, that uh, uh, the immigrants in the West um, uh, are facing. And the, one of the problems for the care gap, I believe, is because of all the inconsistent and complex guidelines that we um, uh, in the hepatology uh, field uh, have produced. I think that we all kind of agree that high-risk patients should be treated, but the problem uh, is that most people cannot really agree on what the phenotypes of the high-risk patients. So you have all of these complicated and slightly different versions of treatment criteria among the different society, the top, the US, uh, the Asia Pacific, the European, and the WHO. But fortunately, the WHO just one month ago, almost exactly one month ago, just released that 2024 guideline, which I feel is much simpler and much more inclusive in that anyone who is surface antigen positive, regardless of e-antigen, ALT, and DNA, as long as they have fibrosis stage two or higher, they should be treated. So uh, this is one major advance that we just uh, have had in the last month. And it's very important to be more inclusive and make it simplify like that because a prior society give you all of the different groups of patients but then in reality, 40% of the patient, even on long-term 10 years follow-up, they cannot fit into any of these uh, phases, but yet they are at high risk. So it's very confusing. And I really feel that it really has contributed to, a, to the worst care gap in HBV as compared to HCV. 
And uh, we also observe that even though they don't fit into any of these categories and technically do not meet criteria for treatment, some of them get treated from our consortium here. And we found, uh, and these are the results of uh, match uh, analysis, and you can clearly see a lower HCC incidence um, in patients who were treated. Now, moving on to HCC surveillance. So we can try to prevent um, HCC from happening. And we have done, we have medication to really help reduce that by substantial amount, like uh, 60 to 80% for both hep B and hep C. However, some still develop HCC. So we still need to work on surveying them and try to diagnose them early if we cannot prevent it. So lots of data um, in the last 20 years have shown that HCC surveillance increases early detection, curative treatment, and survival by twofold. And it has been recommended for 20 years now by different societies around the world in the US and Europe and Asia Pacific. But the problem is that only 30% are diagnosed at pre-symptomatic stage, according to this uh, systematic review here, and only 60% have some history of surveillance. So there are problems with um, poor adherence to surveillance guideline and also problem with the surveillance methods and tests that we are doing now. And a recent uh, US study that we completed here uh, found that actually only 9% of people with cirrhosis and higher 40% of HBV, uh, who are may, uh, many of whom are following subspecialty practice, uh, have evidence of H uh, ultrasound as uh, HCC surveillance every six to 12 months. So, you know, what we observe here is not 100%, maybe 30 to 60%, but um, uh, real world data nationwide, including community practices, are much lower. And here we can only see 10%. So, what are some of the barriers? So, the current barriers is that we have suboptimal surveillance tests. Serum alpha fetoprotein sensitivity is only about 60 70%. Liver ultrasound sensitivity is also very limited. For small lesion, it's only about 40% or worse than that. And it's inconvenient. They have to get a blood test. They have to schedule to get an ultrasound. And at Stanford currently, it, uh, we were just talking about this in our liver uh, practice. Uh, it took like four months to schedule an ultrasound. Uh, and there's cost of direct cost of the test and also indirect cost of taking time off to go and get the ultrasound, scheduling it, et cetera. So we need more accurate tests. We need more convenient tests and together it can be more cost effective because if we have good tests, accurate tests, but if the patient do not use it, then it would not really be cost effective because we don't really save enough lives with it. So in the last uh, five, 10 years, a lot of work have focused on developing liquid biopsy, not just for HCC, but other cancer too, so that we have highly sensitive and specific blood-based tests. And this is based on HCC, um, circulating tumor DNA. So as I already alluded to, you know, there are differences. So liver ultrasound sounds it's kind of simple, but it's actually much more cumbersome on a practical level in terms of scheduling and having to, you know, go to the test versus a blood test. Most patients would go to see the primary doctor and get blood tests about once a year or so. So it can really be incorporated with the regular surveillance, um, uh, health surveillance uh, nicely versus uh, an ultrasound here. So um, this is um, a one of the examples of uh, one of uh, the uh, cell-free DNA uh, blood form, uh, uh, blood-based test uh, developed by Helio Health. And you can see here, comparing with the other uh, tests that uh, have been available, um, the um, accuracy rate with the AURC of the Helio liver test here is higher. But where the new test really distinguish uh, itself from the own and the current test is in early stage, HCC. Specif in late stage, they are all pretty similar, specificity pretty similar for all stages. But the sensitivity for early stage one and two here, where most patients can expect uh, curative treatment is 76% uh, with the new test versus only about 50% with the others. 
And based on those data, we have uh, uh, completed a clinical trial, uh, a prospective lighted uh, multi-center on uh, more than 40 centers in the US here. We enroll about 2000 patients. The results are embargo until May 22nd, but it will be an oral presentation at the European Liver Congress um, next month. Um, the data uh, largely confirm uh, what we found earlier. And then um, uh, this is an, uh, a newer effort about five years ago, I uh, have been able to work in collaboration with our colleagues uh, in the School of Engineering here um, to also uh, look for circulating tumor DNA, but we want to start out with a more enriched test of biomarker candidates via systematic review or published study versus a more, you know, just a large um, uh, high output selection so that we can find more tumor specific methylation signature in the cell-free DNA. Um, and uh, these are preliminary data in um, the um, uh, samples and patients that I enrolled at Stanford to support um, this uh, PhD thesis of a, 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 a student that we co advise And based on that, we have um, completed uh, a enrollment of a larger validation study of about 200 uh, case and uh, control patients from Stanford and a few centers in Taiwan and Japan. So in summary, HCC incidence continues to rise with five-year overall survival remaining low. Uh, globally in the US, alcohol and viral hepatitis remain leading causes with increasing contribution from metabolic liver disease in the coming years. And the current care cascade is very poor globally, including the US from under diagnosis and under treatment, and even in private uh, people with uh, better insurance in the US, like those with private insurance and including people who have very advanced disease like cirrhosis and HCC. Now, HCC surveillance has been shown to improve outcome, but it's also very underutilized and we need better diagnostics tests, more convenient tests to make it more accessible and improve the current adherence rate. So a lot more research and public health efforts are really uh, needed so that we can diagnose HCC early, we can increase the HCC surveillance rate and the effectiveness of HCC surveillance and to prevent uh, um, the occurrence of both viral and non-viral diseases and HCC related to these diseases. I want to acknowledge my team, uh, many of whom are here, current here at Stanford, elsewhere, and the many generations prior. I want to thank my colleagues at Stanford um, and overseas uh, without whom much of the work that I have shown today from these uh, real world consortium would not have been possible. And thank you. Thank you, Mindy, great job. Do we have questions from the audience? Anyone have a question? Then Mindy, do you mind if I ask one? So yeah. you showed so nicely that, you know, it's viral hepatitis, MASLD and alcohol associated mm -hmm. liver disease are gonna be the contributions. So many of these exist together. So in the clinic, in someone with liver disease, when you're worried about future risk, how do you counsel about mitigating risk factors? So for instance, if I have hepatitis B and I ask you, how much can I drink? What are you going to advise me? Ah, okay. <laughs> that is a big negotiation with the patients. Um, so, well, you know, very common people with viral hepatitis or B or C um, would have fatty liver because it affects, you know, 40% of the people. So if they have a viral disease, you know, fortunately we have a simple pill, you know, so we target, usually I try to target that first because that's a simple solution and very clear um, outcome. And then second is that we talk to the patient about uh, weight loss and such. Um, there is a new recent, uh, one medication recently approved for uh, NASH, um, uh, but uh, that's the only option so far and we don't have like a magic pill for alcohol yet. Uh, so generally, if the patient, I want it to be realistic, you know, if we just say that, no, you cannot even have a sip of champagne, you know, at uh, your graduation, then people want, would just say, oh, then they will just shut you out. So if the patient uh, is, is not a habitual alcohol drinker, uh, and uh, then you would say like, you know, one or two drinks, you know, 
every few months, every one, two months, it's okay on special occasions, okay. But if the patient has a history of alcohol use disorders, then I would say no, because usually, you know, very easy for people to slip from one thing to the next. So Dr. Nguyen, I had one question. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the, the primary prevention being so important in the incidence of HCC. And I was curious how much primary prevention is being done by um, primary care clinicians versus specialists, um, you know, who may be also following patients um, with HBV, for example, who do not have HCC. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. That's a really uh, uh, an important question. So the vast majority of patients do not see specialists. So the primary care visits are really the most important. And this is a great opportunity for me to put in the plug that the CDC um, uh, universal recommendation for HCV screening uh, has been for a few years, but as of March last year, the, there's also CDC universal screening for hepatitis B. So, so we need to identify the patients and then we can primary prevention by preventing them from developing cirrhosis and liver cancer, but also to identify the patient who should be vaccinated. Um, so, so hepatitis B, hep C, we do not have a vaccine. Um, hep B, we have very good vaccine. Um, so the new guidelines, uh, CDC guideline for Hep B, includes not just the surface antigen to diagnose disease, but also surface antibody to uh, detect the patients who need uh, who are at risk and probably should get vaccination to prevent the disease, and also core antibody. So this is a new one. Uh, because now we use a lot of biologics that can cause HBV reactivation. So for hep B screening, please include surface antigen, surface antibody, and core antibody. Now, the questions about HCC surveillance uh, in, and treatment in primary care practice, I think that really depends on the community. In the U.S., the majority are still done by IDGI physicians. Um, uh, and the, the, the treatment rate and evaluation rate in primary care are still much lower than in specialty practice. Um, I used to practice as a primary care doctor for three years. So I remember you cannot just focus on Hep B, you have to also focus on diabetes, prostate and everything. Yeah, so, so a lot of it is probably from the time allocation um, uh, between primary care and specialty practice. Oh, you go ahead. Um, we do have a few questions actually on the Zoom and it, it is rising. <laughs> uh, one is um, related to what you'd mentioned, both with the opioid epidemic and then also with um, acetaminophen. So there was a question um, from Dr. Golden related to um, has changing the formulation for some of the combination opioid acetaminophen pills. So the example um, he gave was uh, like um, uh, Norco, which is, Five five hundred mm -hmm. of acetaminophen to five hundred three twenty five. So they've changed some of the formulations to reduce the acetaminophen. Mm -hmm. Has that had an impact on HCC or liver injury? None that uh, none that I that we are aware of because the opioid epidemic. Uh, um, you know, uh, Tylenol. If you do not drink alcohol and if you do not uh, have like. Uh, uh, liver failure already by itself up to 2000 milligrams a day, you know, that should be safe. We can use that even in our transplant population. Yeah. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it causes acute injury, mm -hmm. not, not with chronic. overdose. Yeah. 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 yeah but the, it's still an important measure that was taken, mm -hmm. uh, but it will, uh, it will affect acute injury, not chronic complications mm -hmm. like liver cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then um, another question uh, from, Let's see, Dr. Dana Sekaran. So uh, great job, <laughs> Dr. Nguyen, especially on the importance of anti-HPV therapy, even in patients with HCC. Can you discuss the mechanisms by which HPV treatment may improve survival in patients with HCC and child class C cirrhosis? The mechanism. Yeah, um, uh, great question. And that was the reason why we performed one of the studies that we had to uh, cost specific um, and detailed data, clinical data on HCC reoccurrence. 
so I believe that two um, two two um, prongs to this. Number one is that the antiviral can improve and restore liver function. Many of these people already have, most of them have cirrhosis already and some already decompensated. So the improved overall survival can be from the restoration and preservation of liver function. And if you have restored liver function, you can also be eligible for more treatment because most of the HCC treatment, whether it's uh, liver directed or systemic therapy, we need to have a decent liver function. And the second way uh, mechanism, I think it can improve survival is that it decreased, uh, decreases recurrence. And we show that in the study of patient who had uh, curative resection and that we found both overall and recurrence free survival uh, improved. Another question from our uh, virtual audience um, from Dr. Nasca. Thank you for sharing your outstanding work. Dr. Nguyen, could you please elaborate on the intricacies of social determinants of health specific to HCC risks and mitigation? That is a uh, very good question and topic. very complex and difficult topics. Um, so most of, uh, and, and it's something that we have failed to really look at in details because the data are much harder to get. Um, so some of it we were able to, to indirectly uh, see, like for example, the International Consortium HBV study, the, one of the last ones that I showed there, we found disparities uh, with uh, um, lower treatment rate and evaluation for women and for Asian in the West versus Asian in the East. So it's not something racial, you know, uh, by race uh, by itself, but it must be something with social uh, environment. Um, and, and, and we cannot prove that in that study, but, you know, as we, many of us who see patients from uh, who, um, whose English is not the primary language, you know, there will be language barriers, even if we use an interpreter, uh, interpreter and also health literacy and such. Um, so actually, we try, we want to understand more why patients don't get treatment. How much of this is because the doctor didn't order or didn't advise the patient? How much is patient who don't want to be treated? So actually, Angela, uh, one of um, our uh, students here, uh, initiated a study with a survey you know, a patient and, 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 and ask the patient these questions. So it's ongoing. Hopefully in a few years, we will have enough patients to analyze. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you were going to mention that that was a study that was ongoing. So that's wonderful to hear. Um, from uh, one of our nephrologists, Dr. Abra is asking, we routinely screen patients in dialysis centers for hep B and HCV and have their rates of treatment, cure, and HCC improved in this population for folks who have or on dialysis. Ah, oh, very good question. And I have to admit, I haven't looked at the dialysis pop uh, population specifically. So maybe we will try to do that in the future. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, this is a question uh, from uh, Dr. Chang, who, uh, let's see. Yes, Dr. Chang has asked who, um, from our division chief for primary care and population health, um, Again, mentioning how valuable this work is in, um, he says, and in my own real world high resource practice, I'm sorry to say <laughs> almost no one ends up doing the recommended every six month ultrasounds, both due to sort of kind of patient's acceptance and then it's sort of inadequate reminder systems to do the ultrasounds. How can we improve actual surveillance in daily practice? Um, question. A great question, something that uh, Dr. Ko and I probably yeah. try to think about every day. Uh -huh. so, so there are two issues here. Number one is the decision to, to enter the patient into surveillance. That depends on the patient's risk, right? So if they are very low risk, they don't need. But if they are high risk enough, they need to enter. Once they enter, then the frequency is determined more by the tumor doubling size of the cancer and due to our poor test. So this is a spill I tell the patient because many patients, even though after five years, 10 years, um, I've been doing this for five, 10 years, you know, I, and, and, and there's nothing, can I stop? So I get this all the time. I'm sure Dr. Cole does too. So I have to go through this spill and tell the patient, the problem with HCC is that you feel nothing until 
very, very late, last few weeks or last few months of life. And I could say that the patient who had been diagnosed uh, by symptoms that I have seen in the last 20 plus years, almost all of them would be gone within weeks or a few months. So the only way we can do uh, is to do these boring practices. And why every three months? is because our ultrasound sensitivity for lesion less than two centimeters is very poor. So if somebody have a lesion 1.5 centimeter, we likely will miss it. Six months later, it will be three centimeter. So we will be very likely to pick it up and that is totally eligible for most curative treatment. If you go another year, it'll be six centimeter. That's already outside criteria for liver transplant, for example very specific examples like that um, and 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 then you know most of you are all oh, okay and another analogy I try to use with the patient is that you know just think about like car insurance or how insurance we pay all our lives and we hope we never use it yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. one more question here along those lines of how do you counsel folks I mean I, I was really shocked by the growing incidence of metabolic liver disease and <laughs> didn't realize how close of a link there was, honestly. there. I'd love to know more about how you talk to patients about this when you see it on a radiology report, which we're getting for more and more patients. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we see this, you know, with the prevalence, you know, it's uh, so many cases. And the other thing I want to mention is that in the last 10, uh, 15 years, I have seen younger and younger patients who came to the clinic with fatty liver disease, uh, both early and advanced. In the past, it's more like in the 50s and then 40s, and now I'm seeing 30s, you know, even some 20s. And epidemiology data from NHANES that we have looked at really show a consistent trend. And it started like about 12, 13. So the teenage years is when the obesity and the fatty liver started to go up. And uh, so how do we tell the patient? So this is a very difficult thing. You know, it's so easy for us to say, okay, lose weight exercise, but that's so difficult to do, right? Yeah, and then some, uh, so, so, so because of that, I have, uh, fortunately, we have very good weight loss medications that were, have been approved in the recent years. So I have been referring the patient to weight loss um, clinics uh, so that they can be considered and starting this. And some of us in GI or Dr. Manicat here have been boarded so that he can use it. I said, maybe next sabbatical, I also want to go and do that. Um, but the problem is that um, the, there are not enough people to treat this. And the other one is bariatric surgery. So I think historically, we all shy away from, from it because it's surgical and also people have cirrhosis, many of them. So that's another um, uh, effort that we looked at. And uh, one of our uh, posts, I think Winnie is here. Oh, yeah, she's here. So she has really been looking using nationwide data to look at the long-term outcome of people with fatty liver, severe obesity, who undergo a bariatric surgery. So despite those whatever surgical complication that could occur early, the long-term outcome in terms of incidence of liver problem, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and mortality are much better. So we are hoping to to create, you know, to, 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 to contribute data, to encourage people, you know, we, because if we just tell patients to go home and diet and exercise, you know, it, it doesn't work. We have to give people the right, the tools and help them. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, uh, an additional question, um, Dr. Georgie, does treatment of um, NASH and NAFLD with resmeteron decrease the risk of HCC in these patients? Okay, a very good question, but I think it's too early for us to know. Um, I mean, the, the, the clinical trial just showed that, you know, a proportion of patients have improvement in the liver inflammation and maybe a decrease in fibrosis. Uh, so, you know, see, I mean, if you extrapolate from that, then you would think that it should decrease the HCC risk because the HCC risk is tied to the degree of inflammation and fibrosis. There's an ongoing trial that's answering that question. That's great. Uh, good to know. Um, oh, is that, oh, we have one question in the room. Thank you for your informative talk. And I want to ask about the HCC surveillance. 
In terms of cell-free DNA, I want to ask, is, is it still in the research stage or it's clinically available? Or if, and if it's clinically available, is it covered by insurance or not? Uh, great question. So I am aware that in the U.S. there are already two that are commercially available that, uh, that if the lab, the reference lab carries it, you can actually order it. So one of it is the helio liver test that I have uh, been fortunate to be part of. And the other one is by um, uh, exact science, but currently they are not covered by any insurance that I'm aware of because there are not sufficient data uh, yet. So uh, the clinical trials that uh, we will be presenting um, uh, June 8th at the Liver Congress and the embargo will be released May 22nd. So hopefully with the data that could help bring um, uh, the test uh, um, you know, to, to be available to patients. Uh, the other test, um, uh, the other trial is also ongoing, and we also participate in that study. The enrollment is still ongoing, so I think the data would be lacking more. Uh, and the third one um, that uh, I show you um, that uh, we collaborate with the engineering school here, that one is not yet commercially available. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, from our virtual audience, um, uh, Dr. Leibovitz is asking, is there, are there um, any news about an HCV vaccine? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's a call. Okay? Yeah. People have been working on this for 30 years, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so, no, the answer is not yet. Um, they are proposing now human infection models to test mm -hmm. novel vaccines. Kind mm -hmm. of interesting, but but not yet, the vaccine technology has not caught up. And the last one, which was published in the New England Journal, unfortunately just did mm -hmm. not prevent infection. So it, we're going to there, it will be treatment of disease. Yeah. And the, the, also the, the, the effort on that has of course also gone down because now we have a 95% cure rate with a pill. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Although most diseases are controlled with vaccines. Mm -hmm. just, just as a- Yeah, yeah. Just... Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, one more question uh, from Dr. Clark. Um, do you refer people to um, who have um, alcohol problems to Alcoholics Anonymous, so alcohol use disorder to AA? If so, what's your observation of their compliance? Um, and thanks. Yeah, um, uh, great question. Compliance is very poor. I mean, many patients who are really, really sick um, and, and we make it a condition that they need to go to AA to be listed on the liver transplant, even that many patients just cannot do, do it and, and therefore is not transplant eligible. So that is a, a, a big problem. And then there's also language, you know, do, you would have patients who don't speak English. So some of them will have a hard time finding one in their language. You know, we have a Vietnamese patients and they would have to zoom into an AA from Vietnam at very odd hours. And, you know, so, but we asked them to do that, you know, for our liver transfer and listing. And, you know, we, we, um, we may be asking people to do more than, you know, we um, realize sometimes. COVID has allowed some of these to move online. It has mm -hmm. improved the access some, but there still are the limitations that mm -hmm. Mindy was uh, discussing. And it, it is an area we have to do better, right? Great, um, thank you. Uh, the, the last question, so Dr. Golden had asked, and this, I think you referred to this and maybe to expand upon a little more, um, do, for folks um, who are drinking socially, does that, does that amount of alcohol impact their risk of cancer? Kind of where, is there a threshold? Mm -hmm. The exact threshold is difficult because the quantification of alcohol, even if you have a 10 page survey, you know, is, is difficult. So, so, so I think to get a good alcohol history takes more time. So if we ask, people will say no, right? And then they could drink until last week. So if they say social drink, you know, I, I wouldn't stop there. So how much, you know, like, oh, is it like one drink, you know, and, and how much is a one drink, you know, because a beer bottle can be a small one versus a big one. So, so I, I find myself having to probe in more details to get. So if they just drink one drink, you know, a month or two drinks a month, uh, that it would probably be negligible. But if people drink a few drinks a week, 
uh, that would be significant. So the CDC definition is that, you know, you uh, two, for women, one drink a day, you know, or more is significant. For men, two drinks a day or more. Mm -hmm. Well, I, we are right at the top of the hour. I, Dr. Kwai, I didn't know if you had any additional remarks no, as we close. Other than just thank you for sharing all of your thank insights you. and working contributions. Really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I just, for, for our virtual audience, I just wanted to note that the whole front row here in the room live is filled with Dr. Nguyen's team members, mentees. Uh, it's wonderful to see. And so, um, Again, a big thanks to Dr. Nguyen. Um, join us next week only on Zoom for Grand Rounds, um, same time. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.